Welcome back, uh, lecture 37 this week. So, we are going to continue our discussion uh, from where we left in terms of uh, discussing about gate resistances and parasitic capacitances in, in, a, in a nanoscale MOSFET. Okay. So, we will talk about small signal model today and then we will move towards uh, you know the layout a discussion a generic discussion on the MOSFET layout and about multi gate uh, devices if time permits we also, we also go towards SOI RF SOI platform. Okay. So, over to the whiteboard here. So, you can see that uh, the small signal model or small signal equivalent circuit of a uh, nanoscale MOSFET uh, looks very similar uh, almost identical uh, to that of the small signal models we discussed for MESFET, Gallium arsenide, HAMT etc. except that there is a body here there is a bulk here we do not have a bulk or a body there. For instance, CGD is your gate drain capacitance, CGS is your gate source capacitance, this is your resistance uh, across the oxide, the gate resistance this is very high, this only starts to matter when your frequency is really high, <coughs> Okay, very high frequency, this is your gate resistance, this is of course GM VGS uh, you know the current that is flowing, R0 is the output uh, resistance here actually it is a it is a parallel of uh, a small signal output resistance and a DC output resistance here. This is a drain source capacitance, the drain bulk capacitance, and etc. etc. Now, if you, for instance, want to calculate the FT or the you know the current gain cutoff frequency of this, uh, we have not yet discussed about two port network parameters, you know, S parameters, Y parameters, etc. We will talk about that um, briefly in a later part of this course. But scattering parameters are useful to actually uh, mathematically derive or even measure uh, cutoff frequency FT. Okay. So, the way people define FT is that you have to this is a current gain. So, the current gain actually is a hybrid parameter H parameter to H to 1 there is a you know and you get that from Y parameter which you get from S parameter. So, you know you can measure some parameters you convert to some other parameter and then to some other parameter you can get the gain and from the gain you set the gain to 1 that is your frequency at which your current you know you will get going to get FT. So, the way you calculate is that or you measure is that you actually uh, short circuit the output. So, the output is short circuited. So, the drain is actually connected to the source you short circuit the output. So, what happens is that all of this are short circuited. Okay. So, you can ignore all of this. This also you can ignore because the CDS the drain source uh, capacitance you know its impedance the impedance of this will be 1 by omega CDS. Okay. Uh, so, the impedance of this is much much larger than actually much much larger than the drain resistance. Okay. Even at very high frequencies even at very high frequencies close to cutoff frequency this impedance is going to be very very large which means CDS is very very low. So, it is so large that it is it is much larger than the drain resistance. So, you can actually ignore that. So, what remains is actually this part okay, uh, this part and I will not write down the equation here, but if you if pe and people have done that you do not need to derive it yourself people have done that if you derive if you do that short circuit and you derive it the expression that you will get for FT is precisely the same expression that you will that we wrote down for a gallium arsenide hemp or a MSFET or something. Okay. The same expression will come in terms of GM, CGS, CGD, RI, RS, RD etcetera. Okay. RS, RD all these expression all these values will keep coming uh, will the, the FT expression will look al, al, the identical to what we had written before. Okay. So, that is it F max expression also looks very similar. So, we can we do not need to write them down you can refer to the expressions that we have already discussed in our 3 5 you know chapters in our discussions. So, that is how people do it. Okay. Now, the pertinent thing here, here you know which is which sets the stage different from compound semiconductor of course, this, this part the analysis part here is that there is something called bias depend dependence of this cutoff frequency. So, what is this plot? This plot shows FT versus the drain current per unit width amp per millimeter or you can say microamp per micrometer or milliamp per mi micrometer or in this case it is milliamp per micrometer. So, per unit width the current. So, what do we and these are different drain voltages. So, this is a drain voltage of 1 volt, this is a drain voltage of 0.75, this is 0 0.5, 0 0.25. So, the drain voltage is increasing. When the drain voltage is increasing you see that the peak cutoff frequency more or less remains at the same drain current, which means if you bias the device at a fixed drain current independent of what drain bias you are using, okay, independent of what threshold voltage you are using, you are going to get the same peak 
cutoff frequency. So, actually in the saturation regime this peak point this, this point is called you know the, the peak uh, I think it is called the peak cutoff frequency current density the current density that corresponds to the peak cutoff frequency. This point actually does not depend on the drain bias at all in the saturation regime in the linear or the triad regime this depends very weakly as you can see this ok. So, even people have found that even for Fe, uh, MOSFETs with different threshold voltages this point the peak current density Ft the, the Ft the, the current density that corresponds to peak Ft is constant ok. At the particular current density you are going to get the even if your threshold voltage could be say 0 0.5 volt maybe 0 0.7 volt etc. ok. As long as your current density the drain current density is fixed you are going to get the same peak Ft it is amazing. So, and that peak current density typically is around 0 0.15 to 0 0.4 milliamp per micrometer of the device width of the gate width ok. You as I told you the threshold voltage can change a lot with process technology, but nothing matters because all your bias variations are kind of are not going to affect this point. So, you bias it basically at a fixed IDS to get a constant circuit performance such as an FT and FMAX and the FT and FMAX will remain within 10 percent of the peak value. That is why RF circuit designers use constant current as a design parameter ok as a design parameter. Now, we come to MOSFET layout ok because I told you that design parameter is fine that there is also gate width that you will need and the number of fingers that you will need. These two parameters are also with the designer they will use this design parameters to come up with the optimum layout. So, typically <coughs> for many of these application you need relatively large current and because the MOSFET width is much smaller you know range of tens of micron or something like that. So, you need to have a lot of these fingers interdigitated finger of source and drain you can see this is source this is drain you need a lot of these fingers source and drain to actually enable a reasonably high current to be carried. In this case high current can be even few tens of milliamp or whatever ok. You need a lot of these fingers. So, how do you lay these fingers out what is the layout of this of this device is very critical. All these are via by the way all the black things that you are seeing here are via holes that are you are taking out from bottom to top ok. MOSFET layout is not trivial at all because cutoff frequencies, noise figure, gain, impedance everything depends on the layout the, the gate width the number of fingers etc. Now, this table we will ignore the things here for noise because we have not yet talked about noise we will talk about noise and then we will come back here again to this chart ok once we talk about noise. There is a mistake here the F minimum does not go as 1 by W that is separate but we will come to that here ok noise will come later. But you can see that your GM becomes higher with higher W of course ok. So, your GM is milli cement per millimeter for instance. So, with higher number of higher gate width millimeter your absolute value of GM will increase. So, with a higher W your GM also will be high and the GM also increases as number of finger increases more the number of fingers more is the GM more is the width more is the GM. Cutoff frequency is largely independent of W and also largely independent of N, but in real scenario it may not be uh, completely independent because it is a larger width you know you may have larger parasitics coming in that you may not have compensated. Uh, so, and again if you have larger number of finger and if you are talking about higher frequency then there could be phase delays uh, many things can come in, but in general theoretically it should be independent. F max definitely depends on W with larger and larger W or gate length gate width if your gate width is this is your gate no if this gate width is in higher then your F max is lower because your gate resistance is higher that is why because your gate resistance is higher ok. Parasitic CGS CGD will increase when W is increasing because GM is also increasing and GM by CGS is velocity which remains constant in a way. So, with N and W this also increase. The parasitic resistances like the source resistance, the drain resistance etcetera they decrease as 1 by W they decrease as 1 by N. So, the num larger the number of fingers uh, sorry the more the number of fingers lower is the parasitic resistance. Higher is the gate finger width of each finger lower is the lower is the parasitic resistances. S gate resistance scales as W with larger and larger W gate resistance becomes higher and higher which is a bad thing with number of fingers it goes as 1 by n. So, just keep this in mind please ok. The performance with a given gate length with a given gate width 
with a given gate width per unit mm by the way and a total gate width can depend significantly on the geometry of the layout. See if you just simulate the device based on schematic when I say schematic you know you have a you understand that there is a MOSFET here, there is a in resistor, there is a capacitor, maybe there is another MOSFET etc. If you just do a schematic level simulation it will be very inaccurate at RF frequencies if you do not consider the layout and the extracted parasitics because the parasitics can be very different for the layout. The way you put the layout down with different number of fingers whether the gate is connecting from both side or not, how many VRs are there etc. All these things will affect the parasitics and the performance if you do not use do that then your simulation will not be accurate. So, you have to do the simulation by laying out the exact layout and the parasitics. For example, in a 65 nanometer CMOS node, CMOS node, node you know you are going to get maximum of 0 0.15 to 0 0.2 milliamps of current per micron of gate width. So, 0 0.2 milliamp per micron of gate width. So, if you have a gate width which is 1 micron you are going to carry only 0 0.2 milliamp at max ok. So, now this contact the pad that strip that you have a source drain a strip or a stripe or a gate stripe for instance the gate finger stripe you know uh, or source drain stripe. If you have too wide a stripe if you have a large wide stripe then it will couple more to the bulk correct and so if you you will lead to increased coupling capacitance with the bulk because you have a wider stripe. If you have too narrow if you have too narrow like a stripe like that then the fringing will be more because your area to surface you know the periphery ratio becomes skewed. So, you will get more and more fringing capacitance. So, there has to be an optimum stripe lateral dimension also for source drain and everything the stripe the lateral dimension has to be optimum so that there is neither too much fringing nor too much coupling with the bulk ok. Whether it is a common source configuration whether it is a common gate configuration that will also determine your layout and your parasitics the, the way you design your layout your, the way you want to design your layout. And as I told you also once before the best layout for minimizing the noise for instance may not be the same as the best layout for maximizing the gain. So, the layout could have a very specific application ok. So, please keep that in mind. So, this is again schematic of layouts as you can see uh, you know the gate you are taking this VRs out and then you take this out if you have one finger one like a mini bus bar connecting here one in metallic you know metal connection you take the VR from there you connect it again on the top. So, it keeps criss crossing so you have VRs you connect them you connect them then again you have VRs VRs and again you connect them you keep criss crossing and keep taking out and there is a lot of integration lot of levels of integration by the way so many complexities you know functions and everything are put in together. So, you need to have this so many different metals. Um, so, you know this is just a schematic to show that how the layout you know is done and what kind of uh, you know this is one just example of layout you can have different kinds of layout, but that the main idea is that you have different metal metal 1 m 1 m 2 m 3 m 4 m 5 etcetera different intermetal like dielect intermetal dielectrics via holes plugs etcetera will be there ok. So, this is a 3D uh, again schematic of how it is taking out. So, you know this is a metal 1 and you can see metal 2 metal this is metal 5 this is metal 6 this is metal 7 up to metal 7 you are taking it out you sir from metal 5 to metal 4 to metal 5 metal 5 to metal 6 metal 6 to metal 7 you know you are taking them the via holes these are all vias tungsten plugs that are taking from metal to metal metal to metal ok. This is actually how the layout looks like ok and as I keep telling this is this entire scale CMOS platform is for processing ok logic, but RF devices are also integrated there RF devices are also also coexist on this platform ok. Now, the last thing on this uh, in this topic in general when talking about layout and other things is the multi gate MOSFET. So, in general when you shrink the channel down your, your gate is only controlling the channel from the top. So, the gate control is not very good especially for highly scale device. If your gate can wrap around the channel. So, you see this is a channel the gate is wrapping around it like a from the tree side you know it is it is wrapping around like a sandwich from all side. So, the gate has excellent control on the on the channel it leads to very good GM very good channel control. Uh, you know reduced short channel effect because the gate has very good control we call this multi gate because them it looks like there are many gates here ok multi gate MOSFET. This is again just a schematic just to show the difference between a this is a planar device this is a tri gate device this tri gate is like a multi gate device like a gate wrapped around ok. So, in a planar device you just have a gate which is contacting from the top you use a high k dielectric you use a low k spacer for reducing the external extrinsic capacitances etcetera etcetera in tri gate 
you can actually have multiple threshold voltages because you are going to have a wrap around gate you can have different dielectrics on different side you have very good gm very good sub threshold control you will get nearly ideal sub threshold slope here because you have an excellent gate control okay by maintaining electrostatic control the double gate or the tri gate can help improve scattering because you are having a good electrostatic control okay and this could be on a bulk substrate this could be on a soi okay uh, it could be any on any substrate and you know you can you can engineer it at a better level because you have this gate that is coming around the channel okay of course the modeling is a bit different and the resistances and capacitances that we talked about are also different there could be capacitances between two you know fins you can call it also fin fed by the way uh, dead space capacitance their resistances it is a little different architecture this is a non planar tri gate architecture so the capacitance resistances would be have to be differently analyzed but nevertheless this gives you better or superior electrostatic control okay for specially highly scaled devices this became more dominant i believe around 22 nanometer node or below 14 nanometer 22 nanometer this use a tri gate a 16 nanometer some depends on the foundry global foundry intel samsung a tsmc there is a different foundries they may use 16 nanometer 14 nanometer 7 nanometer 12 nanometer these terminologies are by the way a little bit of a misleading because if you say 7 nanometer it is not that your gate length is 7 nanometer and 7 nanometer of one foundry could be say 12 nanometer in another foundry they could be very similar the way they give the nomenclature is different but actually the device would be very similar so there are things non technical things also that come into picture but in general for sub 22 nanometer 22 nanometer sub 22 nanometer tri gate devices have been adopted and all the logic today in our pocket the cell phone the computer they all use tri gate devices in the logic uh, not only tri gate there is bulk cmos also don't get me wrong but tri gate is used profusely and rf devices are also being adopted in this uh, architecture by the way okay rf tri gate okay so this is for instance an indium gallium arsenide tri gate channel rf device with very high cutoff frequencies on a silicon substrate and that's that's crazy i mean that's that's insane how do you do that actually the process is fairly complicated it's not epitaxially grown usually uh, or all the time what happens is that you have to have a indium gallium arsenide channel on an indium phosphide substrate then you flip it upside down and you bond it to silicon you remove the backside indium phosphide and you do all kinds of process techniques and tricks etc etc to get this but you can get very good performance in this kind of a tri gate indium gallium arsenide channel hemp or sorry in uh, fet on a silicon substrate it's it's actually very impressive okay so tri gate rf cmos was reported long back people started using tri gate rf cmos way back in 2012 which is about 11 12 years back and that i intel had this is one just example there would be other papers also 22 nanometer node they use a tri gate rf soc soc stands for system on chip rf cmos okay it basically established that moore's law was still alive intel has to say that because you know of course it, it 12 years back the the moore's law was going fine compared to today where it's hitting the limits you know and uh, there's a different discussion but we'll not talk about that because we're talking about rf devices here okay uh, and this was this 22 nanometer node tri gate node was actually for atom processor you know center on this was a processor that was released back then you know center on processor they used the 22 nanometer tri gate rf soc on a 22 nanometer platform in a, essentially it is for a logic digital logic platform but they are also using our rf system on chip using the same platform 22 nanometer tri gate devices and they claimed it's the world's first low power etc etc high density and so on so they have a very good transconductance gm they have very controlled oxide capacitance for which they are getting impressive rf cutoff frequency and noise performance they are looking at both cutoff frequency and noise performance okay and they're scaling the passives down we are not talked about passives yet here okay um, and and this is very useful because you have to make like a front end module or you have to make an rf transceiver ic etc this 32 nanometer was a normal planar rf transceiver but now they are adopting they are adopting 22 nanometer tri gate cmos way back in 2012 okay after that of course you can imagine more advancements have happened okay so significantly more advancements have happened 2018 5 6 years back people reported 14 nanometer node fin fat technology for rf applications also so this is a layout you can see source drain gate you know uh, and this is from i believe global foundry okay this paper is from global foundry what does it say it says that maybe i'll remove the annotation here what does it say it says this is the abstract of the paper 
it says they have developed a 14 nanometer logic FinFET platform on that they are going to implement RF by the way that is what the logic is. Their cutoff frequency is 314 and 180 gigahertz for NMOS, 285 and 140 gigahertz for PMOS. They are using a double side gate contact remember double side gate contact we had this double side gate contact right. So, they had a double side gate contact it enhances the FMAX performance to 227 gigahertz from 180 for NMOS and 195 from 140 from PMOS. So, this data was for single side this data is for double side ok because it helps improve the gate resistance cutoff frequency f max improves with double side, but f t does not probably improve ok f t does not improve f max improves that is why they are mentioning f max has improved as opposed to a single side of as opposed to a single side the double sided gate contact has improved the cutoff frequency f max. A significant boost is observed compared to the planar fat essentially because of the source drain uh, etc etc actually there is some part is missing here. So, maybe I can just uh, remove this part so that I can uh, you can see that here ok. A significant com performance advantage is observed compared to 28 nanometer planar p, p, p channel MOSFET 28 nanometer compared to 28 nanometer planar you are getting a significant process uh, performance advantage and of course, because of higher hole carrier mobility because of the silicon germanium stress that uh, layer that gives you stress ok. FinFET because of that you get a better electrostatic control that I already told you suppresses the short channel effects that I already told you such as the drain induced barrier lowering. They are getting a good gain of 34 for NMOS and to sorry 40 for NMOS and 34 for PMOS. There is some discussion on noise also we will cut off cut uh, you know on those and what they are saying is that they are using a deep annual process like their annual is very deep that helps isolate the device and circuit and creates very good isolation. But people use SOI we will we'll come to that in the next slide only people use SOI substrate on insulator to actually improve the isolation, but this is very costly relatively costly. So, quite a few application uses that although it is costly, but in this particular paper they did not use it that is what it means they, they use that deep annual process means that they did not use a silicon on insulator process ok. Now, I am coming to silicon and insulator what is silicon and insulator there is a silicon wafer which call a handle wafer on top of that there is a buried oxide there is an oxide layer this oxide layer could be say few hundred nanometer thick ok there is an oxide layer on top of that you have a thin active silicon layer active silicon layer. So, all the device is built in this active silicon layer this doping of this active silicon layer could be very different from the doping of the substrate layer. So, for instance this substrate layer could be high resistive but this this layer did not need does not need to be high resistive. So, what it there is a there is a basically there is an oxide here that separates the handle substrate silicon from the active thin silicon wafer. What does it do? It gives excellent isolation between devices because you do not have to create any well here to isolate you do not have to create like channel stop implant no deep STI etcetera the oxide will create the isolation because of the oxide you are isolated already ok excellent isolation it prevents crosstalk it prevents latching up and all these things. You have reduced source to bulk coupling and drain to bulk coupling capacitances because this oxide is there. So, the capacitances are significantly reduced this is a thick oxide few hundred nanometer you do not need bulk diodes you do not need substrate contact and it can help give compressive strain for increased hole mobility ok. So, this is an amazing advantage, but the fabrication of this is not very trivial, but and that is why it is costly, but it gives you the isolation that is unmatched in a bulk silicon CMOS wafer ok. You can implement tri gate architecture on RF SOI also you can, but I am just thinking that this is just a platform it's a technology substrate a silicon on insulator technology ok. So, this RF SOI is a silicon on insulator platform that is specifically designed and created for RF high high and high and high performance RF application. This is different from all the discussion we have had till now where RF devices are just implemented on a silicon platform which is made ready for logic you know a highly scaled silicon device architecture that is ready for logic can also be used for RF that is separate all these low power mixers oscillators low noise everything that we are doing low power, but for really high performance application what is a typical high performance application in mobile wireless communication 
you need to make RF chips such as switches, antenna tuners for smartphone, for other handheld devices, for wireless base stations. Okay? So, in this image that you are seeing here, it is just a schematic of a front end module of an RF, maybe a cell phone or a handheld device. Okay? What is happening here is that this is the receiver chain Rx and this is the transmitter chain Tx. The receiver chain has this low noise amplifier, transmitter chain has the power amplifier, all these kinds of duplexers, filters, many things are there. The switch. Switch is a very critical RF component in a front end module. Okay? And the switch basically what it does is that it can route the signals from one component to another component. The switch can make the signal go between the receiver to the transmitter, to the receiver to the transmitter. The switch can route the signal, the switch can route the signal from one component to another. In this case, it can go from receiver to uh, um, uh, uh, transmitter and vice versa. The switch needs to have really high performance parameters. You know things like isolation, isolation loss you know uh, or isolation should be extremely good and then people use a specially designed substrate or silicon sorry silicon on insulator which is specifically designed for RF. So, it is called RF SOI. Okay. There are tuners, there are tuners that antenna tuning, the tuners help antenna adjust to any frequency band. You can have many frequency bands okay, and the tuner will help you adjust to the frequency band that also needs, uh, there is also something called beam forming IC. Those ICs also need very high performance RF components and that is why RF SOI although it can be relatively costlier does not matter people use that. Because cell phone is a huge market in 2 years back 1.5 billion cell phones were shipped on a single year can you imagine that. Okay. So, as long as this market is growing the handheld market the 5G the wireless communication market is growing which it seems like this components will become very important and their volume and the market will increase. So, RF switches and all these components you know even low noise amplifier for that matter on RF SOI will keep increasing. Actually RF SOI can easily compete with the best of 3 5 compound semiconductors also because of isolation being extremely good you can make very good passives and things like that. Okay. So, what happens is that this is your high resistive silicon like the handle wafer, this is your top active layer on which you make the device, this is your buried oxide layer which could be few hundred nanometer and then there is this um, maybe I can use a blue color here. Okay. You can see this, this is your trap rich layer. How exactly this trap rich layer is made you will not get much details because these are proprietary from the vendors or the suppliers who will make them. But this is a layer that is trap rich layer it basically gathers all the traps all the oxide charges. Why? Because if you do not have this trap rich layer then in the interface of oxide and silicon you will have an oxidized silicon oxide interface. No, That will have a leakage a parasitic leakage path. What it means is that if you just have an oxide it is called buried oxide box and there is silicon. This interface will have a parasitic leakage path because there is many oxide charges, trap charges, fixed charges etcetera etcetera that reduce that re, that leads to coupling losses from the active devices on top. Whatever active devices you have you will have RF losses coming in. So, you will not get the benefit of SOI. The parasitic surface conduction will attract free carriers near this, will attract free carriers and form this uh, parasitic channel that will increase the substrate loss the coupling losses. It also increases non-linearities by the way. Okay. So, this is not good. So, the trap rich layer captures the free carriers. So, whenever you have a trap rich layer okay, it will capture the free carrier whatever electrons or free holes etcetera there the trap rich layer will capture. It helps the interface become again resistive it helps the substrate recover the original resistivity and that is why it reduces the RF losses and crosstalk. Essentially the trap rich layer this layer captures all the free carriers that, that forms the parasitic channel at the interface and makes the substrate truly resistive. It makes the interface also truly resistive and you get the benefits of an SOI because your isolation becomes better your, your uh, all the RF losses and crosstalk also greatly substressed and this wafer is compatible with uh, and this trap rich and everything else is compatible with industrial CMOS process you know a budget the thermal budget the temperature to which you take this everything is within the limits of a standard CMOS process. So, no problem here this is a very quick schematic of how they fabricate in a very qualitative way they start with a silicon wafer okay, they oxidize then they implant okay, they implant and put the uh, 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 the dopant for instance then they will do clean and then they will 
flip it upside down and bond it to another silicon wafer. This could be a high resistive silicon wafer. They will bond it, flip it upside down and put it into a high resistive silicon wafer and then they will peel it off, the top one they will peel it off. So what remains is silicon on the high resistive silicon and in between there is oxide because they had oxidized it, this orange color is the oxidation that have flipped it upside down no. So that is why this orange color is the oxidation layer, the box layer, you have flipped it upside down remember and the implantation creates an endo layer below the oxidation layer. When you flip it down that will be above the oxidation layer. So the blue one top here is the end doped active layer because you have flipped it upside down and this is your SOI and the top layer that you remove can be used again whatever okay. So initially people are using a bulk silicon like a doped silicon but the because the oxide is only few hundred nanometer the field can penetrate and that is why it was not a giving a good isolation. So people started using high resistive silicon as the substrate or the handle. This is a highly resistive silicon the resistivity could be 1 kilo ohm centimeter or more. So it is highly resistive so even if the field penetrates it is highly resistive silicon so there is no issue. It has an allowed monolithic integration of front end module you get better size extremely good performance reliability because you are using the CMOS process you can any day outperform compound semiconductor devices in terms of process integration, volume, scale, economy, everything okay. And it can give you really low cost, large volume and excellent isolation and hence very very good noise figures, very good uh, you know switch performance for instance all these things are easily obtainable on this okay. So these are some of the is like a historical trend how people started working on uh, SOI. The first SOI probably with uh, for RF was reported about 27 years back 1997 and then people introduced the trap rich layer about 18, 19 years back okay. And then you see in 2003 they had an RF switch on this high resistive SOI, 2009 they made a power amplifier at around 2 gigahertz okay on the SOI platform. These are all planar CMOS by the way, 2009 they made a front end integration module okay, they made a 60 gigahertz power amplifier it is at 65 nanometer node it is crazy actually right. And uh, this is some of the publication that people have and volume production in the market in 2005 people are talking about 3G switches in 2009 they were talking about Wi-Fi LNA and now 2013 this is about 10 years back the full front end integration has been done on SOI on CMOS and CMOS okay. So SOI is a very mature technology now and it is used for really performance you know the, the applications like RF switches and tuners where performance is the main uh, you know uh, one of the main criteria. So the, the cost does, does not necessarily matter but in all the low cost large volume application low power low voltage people still use the bulk CMOS without SOI uh, and there is a lot of research going into the direction also. So with that we will conclude lecture today uh, we have come to an end here lecture uh, 37 uh, we have 3 more lectures pending where we will uh, first we will talk about uh, a little bit about noise in MOSFET briefly and then we will go to uh, LDMOS okay the high voltage uh, counterpart of MOSFET high voltage for competing with the likes of gallium nitride or gallium arsenide for high power amplifiers. So that is for LDMOS so we will talk about that in the next 3 lectures 38, 39, 40 okay. So thank you for your time I will see you in next class.